with this company for I've been, been, been with this company for uh, more than uh, uh, six years. Um, before that, I was with uh, Alibaba, uh, the IBST um, for a few years. And before that, I was in various different ventures. Uh, basically all, all my, all my uh, uh, career, um, after my academia career, um, as you can see, I was a professor, but ever, ever since I left the university, uh, I have been in the um, industry of uh, big data and IT and, and AI technologies. And I've been uh, uh, a product manager uh, mostly, most of the time. So what is privacy computing? Um, we, 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 need to, we need to take a step back and, and look at some of the uh, challenges uh, on uh, where we are and our whereabouts before we, we, we talk about privacy computing. So a little bit of, of history uh, lesson, if you will. All right, so um, we, as we all know that actually we are now at, um, uh, on the verge uh, or already in the uh, era of data or data era, right? So before this, uh, we were in the uh, age of information, right? So the, the difference here is this. So uh, the, in the age of information, uh, we have been pretty much driven by our all kinds of IT or uh, applications. Uh, it could be business applications, could be personal applications, but um, the, the, there has been an enormous amount of data that's been generated based on the, those applications, right? So the, uh, the data, they, they are uh, varying in qualities. Um, they, can, they, they have been collected for all kinds of different purposes. They could be uh, non-standard, unstructured, and uh, uh, most of or uh, uh, siloed, meaning that they're separated. So, in, in the data era, all of these data coming from previous age of information has become a asset. Um, so, people are comparing it to um, oil, to gold, to land. Essentially, a, a product production factor. Sometimes you call it. So, the, the important thing about this new uh, production factor uh, data is it, it, it is intrinsically different from uh, the uh, the other production factors that I just mentioned. But I, I'll give you a few examples. For example, uh, data is virtual, right? It, it's not something that you can you can uh, dig out of the, the the soil and hand it hand it to someone else, right? It's non rivalry. What that means is uh, data. You can have data, and I can have the same data. It's very easy to, to copy, okay? It's not like if it's a piece of gold, if you have it, then I don't, right? And so, so data also has a huge production cost, but negligible replication cost. What that means is, uh, as we are, a lot of us are in the uh, biomedical uh, uh, world, so we're pretty familiar with, for example, um, uh, NGS sequencing, right? So, so if you spend, you can, you can spend $1,000 to do a whole genome sequencing, produce that, that data. So that's the production cost. But if you just make a copy of that and give it to someone else, the re replication cost is very, very low. So what that means is you cannot simply just copy the data and give it to someone. You, you may lose a lot of the value of the data by doing that, right? So um, data is also a reusable, et cetera. So I won't get into too much details, but I, I think I've covered some of the most important, unique uh, data uh, characteristics. Econ economically. And there's also non-economic dimensions of data. For example, we all know that you know, the, the security and the privacy uh, of, of the data, the confidentiality of the data, these are all things that people, it could be personal data, it could be business data. There's a lot of trade secrets in, in those data. And if it's a personal data, the um, geno genomic sequencing data essentially is your source code, right? You, you simply don't wanna hand, hand that data to somewhere else. But at the same time, we all know that data has a huge amount of value in them if, if you use them correctly. So, so hence the question, how do you actually use the data while protecting the data at the same time, right? So that's basically um, the need that, that, that's calling for the, need, uh, the solution uh, for, for protecting the data, for protect, protecting data privacy while using the data. So I'll, I'll just bring to your attention a couple of uh, uh, numbers here on the left side. Um, by year 2023, when 80% of the company will be facing at least some kind of privacy focused data protection regulation. So when, while you're trying to use the data, uh, you're facing the uh, um, 
a firming up a regulation. Right? At the same time, um, also another, another interesting number here, um, more than uh, 1 million organizations will have appointed a privacy officer for data protection. Right? I, I've run into a number of uh, uh, CPOs, chief uh, privacy officer from large organizations, meaning that really uh, the pri privacy of the data has become more and more of a king issue for the large organizations to, 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 be, um, to be aware of. But at the same time, again, again, how, how, do, you use, how do you use the data, right? How, how do you, how do you uh, utilize the data and, and uh, mine the value out of the data? That's the question here. So large, we want a large amount of the data value comes from data sharing, okay? So quite often, uh, if you're sitting just on a, a hard drive of data, um, it's, it's just lying there. The data really uh, quite often is when you are finding applications, when you're working with someone else, we build some, some collaborations, it could be business collaborations, or you can just hand your data to an app, for example, and then in return, you'll be getting some, some, something, some, some value in return. So a lot of this um, value of the data comes from the sharing, sharing and collaboration part. But the core principle here should be, uh, uh, based on the, the dimensions I just talked about earlier, a few, uh, a few slides back, uh, the, the unique characteristic of the data. And I think the conclusion really is the raw data should never be shared. But at the same time, we need to find a way to share the data value. That should be, that should be a compromise or that should be a um, solution here. So the solution is obviously uh, privacy computing, right? Or um, privacy enhancing uh, computation. So Gartner, uh, a, a pretty famous um, independent uh, organization has named uh, privacy enhancing computation as a top strategic technology trends for uh, 2021 and 2022, two years in a row. Right? And they were calling it uh, by year 2025, 50% of large organizations will be adopting uh, this technology right? to process data in an untrusted environment. It could be any kind of complicated environment. At the same time, you wanna be able to do a data, uh, generate data value and uh, protect the data. Okay, so uh, this, this, this graph on the left is uh, maybe a little old. It's, it's back in 2019, but it was also by uh, Gartner. Um, so this term here, confidential computing is essentially privacy computing. Uh, as you can see, it, it's actually still very early in the, in the whole uh, curve of the uh, hype curve, right, for, for technology. So we all know, so, so for, for you using this, you're using this we, we, we should know that uh, privacy computing is actually still quite early. Uh, not, not exactly still in its infancy, but um, we do see that uh, it's early. Um, people are just starting to talk about it and people are starting to uh, adopt, uh, adopt it in the, in the, in the past uh, few years. Okay, so uh, what is privacy computing really, right? So um, privacy computing, uh, if you want to compare it to a traditional way of doing computing, uh, which is on the left side, uh, a traditional way of doing uh, computing and data sharing is like this. So you have a data platform, right? Some owner has some data and someone else, a third party company wants to use this data to do something, right? To generate, maybe build a, a model for a disease screening, for example. So they, they asking to use the data. So they send a query to it and the data owner will need to send the data itself to the third party company. And then they use the data, then they generate some results, right? They may need to sign some NDA, right? So during that process, the data has left the original owner, left their control, going to uh, another party. Sometimes you can trust the party. Sometimes you cannot trust the party. Sometimes that, even if you can trust the party, they got hacked, right? So uh, you, really the, once the data has left you, uh, it's really, really hard to, to, to know what, what's gonna happen to the data. Now, using privacy computing is essentially, the way it's different is you are now hosting your data in a controlled environment. So this controlled environment, it could be one platform or could be a network of platform. Okay, so, so this, this square here is, 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 it could be a network. Okay, just, just think about it as like, like a, a environment. So within this environment, um, 
the application for the third party company should not be should no longer be outside this data platform, but instead it should be inside the data platform in here. Okay, this way, doesn't matter uh, what kind of uh, um, application this is, everything happens within this controlled environment. So the raw data should never leave this environment. But at the same time, the entire computing process can be secured and invisible if you do it right. What that means is this privacy computing platform or technology needs to be um, proof for lot, lots of lots of different application scenarios. Sometimes, you know, um, people who, who, who deposit the apps or models into this platform uh, environment can be, can be evil, right? They, they, can be, they can try to do something. They, 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 they may want to steal your data, et cetera. So um, this control environment should be able to protect the data user, even if the data application is, is malicious, right? And there's also, you know, what if the data does get stolen? What, what do you do, right? And all, all of these different application um, and, and challenges needs to be addressed by these privacy computing and platforms. Hence, it, it is privacy computing indeed is a very complicated and sophisticated technology. Or well, it's not one technology, right? It's actually a, a set of different technologies. So I'll give you guys, you guys a quick overview, including you know, from, from left to the right, these are different um, mainstream um, privacy computing technologies, including the first one, multi-party computing and uh, homomorphic encryption. These are two different things, but they're, they're roughly in, the, in, in one category where um, multiple data owners, they want to participate in some kind of collaborative computing safely without a trusted third party. I'll go into more details in, in the next few slides. Right. And there's also federated learning, which is a machine learning model. How, how do multiple players train a machine model, a machine learning model? Again, without trusting each other, without, without revealing the raw data, how do you do that? Right. And there's also a kind of like a black box kind of a solution where you, you have a controlled environment and everything happens in here. Okay, so this is something called a secured sandbox or TEE. Okay, so, so these are different technologies. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be giving you some more, uh, uh, more in-depth, um, simple, but more, in, uh, more detailed um, explanations on how these technologies work. Okay, so first one is MPC, multi-party multi computation. Okay, so um, remember what we just said, multi-party co computation is really a set of technology, right? It is based on uh, crypto, uh, cryptography. Uh, to support multiple parties to jointly do something. It's, it's, you can compute a function essentially over all these inputs while keeping the, these inputs private, okay? So as you can see here is the function and all these players, each one of these players may be sending their input into the function. They, they jointly calculate something. But at the same time, all of these input will, are, are protected. Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example. So Andrew Yao, uh, who was a professor at Princeton, uh, a, a Turing uh, Award uh, winner, um, very famous um, scientist uh, in, in computer science. Uh, computer science. Uh, he, he, he was the first one to raise the famous uh, millionaire problem. And uh, he used MPC as, the, uh, as a solution to it, right? So, so the, the problem is, is presented as follows. There are two millionaires, one is Alice, the other is Bob. So they each has a lot of money, but um, they are not you know, friends with each other. So they, they maybe, you know, they, they want to challenge each other and, and see who has more money, but at the same time, they're not feeling comfortable to share the money, the, the amount of money with each other. So how do they do this, right? Keep your secret, but at the same time, get a result essentially, right? So the way that to do this is, um, uh, again, this is a much simplified uh, by the uh, scenario here, right? So let's say Alice and Bob, let's say Alice has $10 million and Bob has $30 million. Well, let's make it more exciting. Alice has $10 billion and Bob has $30 billion. And they do not want to let the other party know, okay? But at the same time, how, how, do, they, how do they compare this? 
So uh, we can we can set up this um, we can set up this solution as follows, right? So that first off, let's let's make it simple. So Alice, each one of them can have only uh, three different uh, possible numbers: 10, 20, and thirty. Okay. So in total, there will be a nine different combinations of possibilities here, right? So A, Alice, B, Bob. Alice can have ten here. Bob can have 10, 20, 30, and uh, Alice can have 20, 30, et cetera, et cetera. So a total of nine um, uh, possible combinations and the result will be here, right? So uh, if A and B both have 10, the result will be 10. So all these nine different possibilities will be locked into these nine boxes on the right side here. So, um, and the result with it, for example, the first box may be 10, 10 and equal, okay? The second box will be 10, 20 and less than. Right, so a total of nine, nine uh, solutions, uh, possible scenarios. And we use, we throw these possible combinations into the boxes, then we lock them. We lock the boxes using two keys. One key is um, for Alice and the other key is for Bob. We, we have two locks, right? For each lock, only Alice can use her key to, to for first lock, Alice can use her key to, to, uh, um, to unlock it. And uh, for the second key, only Bob can use his key to, to unlock it, okay? So, and for, again, for the first uh, uh, box, it will be, uh, Alice has to use 10, Bob has to use 10, and then will be, will be unlocked, okay? But once we create these boxes, we'll just uh, let Alice own her own key, which is 10. Bob own, own his key, which is 30, okay? So then we shuffle the box. We shuffle all the boxes, and then we start asking Alice and Bob to uh, unlock these uh, boxes. So Alice will use her key, which is 10, to unlock these nine boxes. She will try that, right? Only three boxes will be unlocked, right? So that will be these three, three boxes. Alice will be 10, and Bob will be 10, 20, 30. So Alice unlocked these boxes, but without knowing uh, you know, how much money uh, Bob has, because there are three boxes, right? And then Bob start using his key, which is 30, to try to unlock all of these boxes. At the same time, at this time, he doesn't know how much uh, Alice, which key Alice used to unlock the first, first box, okay? So Bob will try to unlock these boxes and uh, this one will click and uh, open the box. So at this point, the result in here will be showing you know, less. So we know A has less money than B, you know, only 20 billion less, right? So, um, and, but at the same time, we, so we get the result, but at the same time, Alice does not know how much money uh, Bob has, and, but Bob doesn't know how much money Alice has, right? So, so that's kind of the, the way to do this uh, using MPC, okay? So as you can see, uh, very obvious, obviously, this is a highly, highly um, scenario dependent, use case dependent solution. Okay, based on each solution, you may need to write a specific algorithm to solve that problem. Okay, and the other thing is there's a, a large amount of um, overhead here, including I/O, file I/O, result I/O, input output, etc., and overhead, computation overhead, etc., to solve these problems. So this is why uh, MPC. Um, is a very specific solution for certain problems. You cannot, it's hard for you to use MPC to solve every single problem out there. But there are problems where you can use it, okay? I, and there are applications that's built on MPC. Um, but in general, it's, it's quite limited. And uh, there's a uh, overhead, it used to be um, tens of millions of uh, six, seven orders of magnitude uh, overhead. But now it's, it's been, uh, people have been working really hard to try to improve it. So it's improving. Okay, so that's the first uh, privacy computing technology, MPC. Now the second one, federated learning. Okay, so this one was invented um, and published by Google. Okay, so for this case, where you have three different data sets here, data sets one, two, three. Okay, each data owner own uh, their own data set and they do not want to share the data with someone else, with anyone else, but at the same time, they want to build a model that leverage all the data, all the insights from these data. So uh, this is specifically for machine, machine learning, okay? So what happens is 
that there is a centralized server that will be passing some of the intermediate results of the machine learning uh, process from one data owner to another. So what happens is this data owner will train his model, pass that intermediate result to, to here, and then we'll be passing on to the second one. Uh, they, they will train, they, they'll further to tune this model using their data, send, send the result back and pass on to the next one. So it's kind of an iterative process, okay? But after a while, you know, the, 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 the final result will, 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 will uh, converge and you will get a model that's essentially uh, trained by all of these uh, uh, data sets. But um, what happens here is obviously the, thought, the data, the raw data has not been shared with each other. Only the, some intermediate result of the model parameters has been passing back and forth, right? So, so that's how federal learning uh, works. So there are different ways to uh, do uh, federal learning or different use cases, okay? So let's start with a simple one, the horizontal federal learning on the right side. So imagine uh, these are like two um, hospitals, okay? One hospital has uh, 200 patient data. The other hospital has 500 uh, patient data. Each one of them is not enough, but they can share the data. They, they can use horizontal learning to uh, share those data. So essentially you're expanding your sam sample size from 200 or 500 to 700 to, to a larger data set, okay? But all of these data having the same features, what that means is they have the same dimensions of the data. For example, gender, age, you know, disease, medication. You're basically just building a larger data set with the same kind of uh, dimensions. That's called horizontal uh, federal learning, okay? The, the way it works is still, uh, uh, it's the same describing the last page. But vertical federal learning is a little more complicated. Um, it's, it's basically uh, it's the same sample, but different features, okay? Uh, one example would be, let's say you have a uh, consumer who has been purchasing something from Amazon, right? And then he goes on to Google to do, to, to do the, uh, some search. So it's essentially the same sample, the same subject, across these two different data sets, but different data dimension. On Amazon, you're doing things like browsing at certain things, you're purchasing something, you're returning something, right? So that's your uh, behavior on Amazon. Th those are the data dim dimensions. But then uh, here uh, on, the, uh, on Google, you may be just browsing uh, and, and searching for certain article, uh, a certain person, on the vacation spot, etc. So these two things are on the same person, but different features. So federal learning can also deal with these kind of application. Basically, without sharing the data itself, but you can build a more comprehensive uh, model for a certain person, right? So this is this basically reiterating what I just mentioned from the last page. Horizontal uh, federal learning give you, you know, example is hospital and hospital together to build a larger sample set. The vertical uh, federal learning is essentially hospital and a lab maybe, right? And uh, so it's the same patient, but more features. So you have a more comprehensive model. Okay. So one use case, one, one uh, relatively well-known uh, use case for federal learning that could be relevant to the audience here today is the Melody project, which is a um, project that has been um, uh, going on in Europe for a while. So Janssen is the company who has initiated this process, but essentially they wanted to um, do a large data um, collaboration among like more than 10 pharmaceutical companies, okay? And each one of them wants to uh, want a bigger and better model, but they don't want to share data with, with each other. So they, they use a federal learning uh, to, to solve that problem, right? Exactly what I, what I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, so so this, this has been a, a uh, very, um, uh, well-known uh, project. And I think it's very easy for, for people to imagine, right? Using federal learning, that could be a lot of things that, that can be done um, without, without worrying too much about sharing the raw data. Um, so so th th that's a typical use case. Okay, so that's two technologies, MPC, federal learning. And the, the, the next one is a, a trusted execution environment, TEE. Okay, so this is basically a hardware-based 
um, solution. Okay, uh, built by the hardware is something that's is, is like a, 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 a chip based solution. That's built, the chip uh, is is um, built by built by a lot of uh, um, providers nowadays. For, for example, Intel, for example, AMD, uh, and whatnot. They they are building this um, TE um, solution for people to do data collaboration. Okay, so TE essentially is a isolated execution of computation environment. Okay, so imagine it is essentially a black box. So in this black box, what you could do is you can have a data and a model uh, collaboration interaction, right? So let's say data is there's a data owner and there's a model owner. They want to, they want to do some kind of collaboration, but uh, they don't they don't necessarily trust each other, and they both think that data and the model, the IP in the model, are, are, are their essential assets. But they really wanted to collaborate, right? Uh, data data owner may want to may, may want may, may want to sell the data. The model owner uh, may want to improve their model and mine something out of out of the data. So how do they do this? They can use TE, and they can use this environment where everything goes into the environment encrypted, right? The model can be trained in here. And then the, you spit out some results from the, from the black box, which is um, uh, decrypted, okay? So, so the results will, will, will be out. So um, this provide, this TE solution essentially um, provide a few things. One is the data integrity, meaning that whatever data that goes into the environment um, cannot be tampered with, okay? So what, whatever data that goes in stays in there and is protected, it cannot be altered. Okay, nobody else can, can do anything to it. And whatever the model that goes in there, the code goes in there is also, the integrity is also protected. So the code cannot be replaced, cannot be modified by unauthorized entities, right? So you essentially you, you, you're guaranteed um, the, the, the computation will, will happen in, in here with, with the original intention. Okay, so that's what TE uh, does and offers. So a typical use case will be, like I said, a, a data owner and uh, maybe an AI drug discovery company. A data owner could be a pharmaceutical company uh, who has a lot of data that they want to find some solution providers, some AI drug discovery company to, to help them out um, because they do not necessarily want to or have the capability to uh, do uh, all of these work all by themselves. I think outsourcing, right? Large pharmaceutical companies may just want to outsource some of these technology um, piece to, to AI companies. But the data obviously is very valuable for the pharmaceutical companies. And the AI drug companies, they want to protect their models. So that's one typical solution for a TE um, uh, collaboration based on TE technologies, right? Okay, so, so far we have talked about MPC, we talked about federated learning, we talked about TE from left to the right, okay? So um, just a, a brief summary for these technologies. There, there's really no um, a, a necessarily a better solution one way or the other. It's really depending on what we call the trust assumptions and performance requirements for people to decide which one of these technology is actually better for their own use case. For some use case, MPC might be better. For some, some use case, federal learning could be better. For some use case, TE could be better. Okay, in terms of the performance, um, TE is actually the most efficient because uh, once everything goes into the black box, uh, can, they can be decrypted so they can be just running like normal applications. So the overhead there is quite low. You, you're slowing everything down by maybe 10, 15%. But for MPC, like I said, it could be thousands or millions of times uh, slower. But for federated learning, it's um, somewhere uh, in between, but uh, relatively pretty good, pretty good uh, uh, efficiency. But the a minor downside is um, it's limited to machine learning uh, only, right? So there, there are a lot of applications that you, you cannot you cannot use. There's also some computational uh, overhead that's associated with federated learning. Okay. There are also other technologies such as differential privacy, etc. I won't, won't, won't be able to go into details for those, okay? 
So, so far we have done a overview of uh, privacy computing or privacy enhancing computation technologies, uh, some of the basic working principles of them. But I would say um, we cannot just stop here. Okay, so for privacy computing, privacy computing is a very neat, a very powerful uh, technology, but it's not enough with, it, with just privacy computing itself, it's not enough to solve the problems you have. Okay, I'll give you an example. Let's say we have a CRO company up here. And the CRO company wants to do some medical research uh, work for a pharmaceutical company, but they, they want to find patient data, right? Meeting the following conditions. Certain symptoms, diagnosis, biomarker, certain biomarker, um, certain sequencing, genome sequencing, uh, result, and the date, et cetera, et cetera, a whole, whole bunch of uh, search uh, criteria. So um, the, the company wants to find these data from the following organizations. Some hospitals, maybe a sequencing company, a lab, right? So the top guy is a, uh, the CRO company is a con data consumer. But down here is, is a data, are the data sources, okay? For this kind of, for this kind of um, work to happen, originally, the CRO company needs to have the data from the hospitals and sequencing company. They have to get the data out of those hands back to their company and onto their server and they do the, do, do the work, right? But here, uh, what we want, want to say, what we want to present really is a possible way to actually solve this problem without going through that trouble, okay? But with a different set of challenges, of course, right? So the first challenge will be data governance, okay? So all of these data, raw data from these hospitals, they are, um, disorganized and they are non-standard raw data, okay? So as you can see, all, all of these different shapes essentially saying they are different kinds of data, they're not organized, non-standard. So you need to do a data governance first, okay? All right, so once you've done the data governance, you need to build a common data model, right? So then by now, we see that all the data from different, different hospitals, they are following the same format, uh, a standard format where, you know, you have the ID, you have the EMR record, you have lab test imaging, et cetera, et cetera, right? So now it has been, data has been harmonized uh, or um, uh, um, cleansed and uh, uh, structured, right? So now you, you build a common data model. At this point, you will be able to know that certain, what, where the certain data is at, at a certain uh, organization by doing a data query. Okay, so the data query is actually the next thing. How do you do a data query across all of, all of different organizations? Okay, so, um, and at the same time, without revealing the raw data from these organizations, because we, we all know, and I've, I've, I've been talking to a lot of these companies, um, many of them are saying that nowadays it's getting harder and harder for you to for a CRO company or data research company to get the data from these organizations just simply due to the tightened um, uh, 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 data protection uh, regulations, right? So with that, with, with that kind of challenge, how do you actually do these data queries, right? How do you, at the same time, how do you protect the query themselves? The CRO companies, when they're doing this query, they do not want these data sources to know they're doing a certain query. Right? So how do you do that? Right? So, so that's also another challenge. And then finally, once we've done the data governance, we've done the privacy um, protected uh, inquiries, and then we, we, we come to the point where we do computation, right? The computation could be uh, some kind of uh, AI, uh, some kind of BI, you know, statistics models, some AI models where um, you want to deploy these model at all of these organizations and run these models and get the insight back. So this, this kind of, uh, this is echoing what, what I talked about earlier, the case where we compare traditional uh, computational methods versus uh, privacy computing methods, right? You want to keep the data where they are, but you want to deploy models and you want to get results, generate insights, generate a collected insights across all of these 
data sources and uh, return that back to whoever um, the, 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 the consumer is, right? So only at this point, only at this stage, uh, we are using technology, privacy computing technologies such as federated learning, okay? But previous, the, in the previous slides, we do not, we are not using uh, privacy computing technology, but we, we still have things that we need to, uh, we have challenges we, we, need, to, we, need, we need to handle, uh, such as data governance, such as data cleansing, building common data model, doing cross node uh, data query without revealing uh, the data, without revealing the query, right? So all of these things, they're not privacy computing technology um, uh, tar target, but they are just equally important for you to uh, do these, these kind of uh, uh, large scale data collaboration and data sharing, right? So that's kind of the point here. Um, just using um, privacy computing here is not enough. You need to have a full stack technology here, okay? So coming from, from the left side data, raw data, to, from the, to the right side, the actual value of the data, you need to have a whole suite of technologies in here. Okay, I'm not gonna go into details, but like I said, there's data governance here, right? You have to also handle where the storage of the data, what, how, how do you do the computation of those data across these different nodes, and then the, the privacy computing themselves, then you do data analysis and you do data liquidity. What the data liquidity, what this means is um, if you, people sharing data with each other, how do you actually credit people who have contributed the data to this collaboration by right? using an early example uh, like a uh, uh, melody uh, example where more than 10 um, data collaborators uh, are, are contributing to a big project how do you actually make sure each one of them get paid or get the, the right amount of payback because these complicated computations can be really really uh, complicated right so uh, you may be uh, contributing a hundred uh, patient records he may be contributing ten thousand uh, a thousand. Uh, so the, the other party may need to get 10 times as, as a bigger return, right? But then uh, the, the first guy may have contributed a little bit something else. They, they may have contributed some computational resource. So how do you make sure all of these things are tracked and find a pricing model uh, to make sure everybody can, can get feedback, right? So, so that's kind of what data liquidity means here, okay? And uh, uh, a lot of technologies can be used here. Uh, for example, one, one, one thing is blockchain. So we all know that blockchain is a technology where uh, you, can, you can use blockchain as a ledger, right? And uh, keep track of everything and nobody can tamper with the ledger. So blockchain in that sense is a perfect solution for this. So, so with the full stack technology, we'll be able to do everything here, right? We can go from data governance to actually computing and do the resource allocation. Finally, that was the most important thing, realize the value of the data, but at the same time, um, make sure that uh, uh, the data of the value is unleashed. Uh, and by the same time, you know, the, the privacy, et cetera, et cetera, are protected in this whole process. Okay, so, so that's, kind of, that's kind of the whole purpose of having privacy computing, but not stopping there, uh, developing a more comprehensive solution for this. So with everything like that, with, with everything we just talked about, the future, what's the future will look like uh, in our mind, in my mind, right? In, in the future, I think, um, we're gonna have a, something, called, something like a data cloud. Data cloud is, is not a new concept, okay? But we do have a flavor here. Uh, that comes from having the technology uh, of privacy computing. Essentially, just imagine uh, from, from bottom uh, to, to, to top, if you look at this uh, diagram. On the bottom, you, you may have different data nodes. Okay, it could be health insurance company, it could be a hospital, it could be a genetics company. Each one of these companies will deploy a data node with some software, right? A privacy computing based software. And you may develop a common data model. And only after that, that's done, all, all data will be following the same standard. At that point, you'll be able to form a virtual data layer. At that point, you'll be able to do all kinds of applications on here, okay? And then all the users, all, all of these users will be able to use these applications 
to generate whatever they need the, the inside the model, the application from the data down here. Okay, so everybody up here, the user, they don't really care about the technology down here. All they need, all they want is they can find the data, they can use the data, they can generate value. Okay, and this is what the technology will will try to try to um, try to provide for these users. If just exactly that, building this network down here based on privacy computing and all the full suite technology, the data will become visible. It will, will become available, accessible to all of these users up here. At the same time, all the data privacy will be will be protected, or the uh, IP will be protected. Okay. So in my mind, this really is how the future of the data technology, data cloud will be like. So um, all these organizations can be connected without worried about their data, without worried about protecting their IP or, or, or data. It will be just kind of you 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 turn on a a faucet, the, the water will just flow, will just flow out, right? You turn on electricity, uh, you turn on switch, the light bulb will, will light up. You don't have to worry about, you know, what's behind it. It, it, it should just happen. But, but at the same time, you can rest assured your, your data is protected, right? So this is, this is a um, long-term vision that I think what privacy computing based uh, IT solutions should bring us to. Okay, so um, let me just give you guys a, a couple of examples, real, real quick ones, just to show you what really um, nowadays, right? So, so the, the, the slide I just show you is the long-term vision, it's the future, but we're not quite there yet. We have to take this one step at a time. So um, we may be building a small network here or there. We may be doing some relatively separate uh, separated uh, uh, um, applications here or there, right? So I'll give you a few examples and, and show you where things are nowadays. Some of these examples are done by my company. Some of these examples are done by other people, okay? So this first one is the one I, I mentioned earlier where you have a data source, a data owner, where you have a AI drug discovery company they in this environment of privacy computing black box, kind of like a TEE or sandbox, they can do collaboration. So this vendor, data vendor, they have a huge amount of data, they, which they think is really valuable. They want to make money out of it. Um, but at the same time, if they do just sell the data, give the data to someone else, to the buyer, they're gonna lose it, okay? So they just cannot afford to do that. So they want to protect the data. Well, to sell the data at the same time. AI company wants to use the data, do this, do some amazing things that protect the, the model, right? So using the black box, they, they can do this. So this is something that's already happening in the market, right? This is something that's already being done. Okay, another uh, fun example here is for an organization on the right side, uh, let's not say who, but it's a major city, um, a, a health um, management uh, agency where they have these cameras showing in the back alley, the rodents activity, okay? Uh, rodents are roaming in these alleys. So they want to find AI companies to do image uh, recognition, count the number of rodents, okay? <laughs> so, so they want to keep the rodents under control essentially, right? But um, obviously these data are highly sensitive. They don't want this to, to leak out onto YouTube, right? So they provide this data, and in here into the, into the black box, the training data essentially, uh, and all these AI vendors will come in and pro provide their data, provide the, the solution. So in this black box, um, they, the models can be trained, can be uh, spinning out results and can be compared using certain metrics. And then the vendor, the, the uh, data owner, this organization, will pick the, the best solution without worried about data get leaked out. Okay, so this is kind of similar to the last, to, to the previous example, but different application. And there are also people who, who can use these data, large organizations can use these, these data to do uh, competitions. They can find, you know, who has the um, best uh, solution, right? There's all kinds of competitions you can, you can do, all kinds of uh, uh, vending uh, procurement process you can do using these kind of technology. There's also a cross-border data collaboration nowadays where you can 
have highly sensitive data, patient data across different nations where you cannot, nowadays, you cannot send the data to other countries, okay? But how do you actually allow people from other countries, the researchers from other countries to visit your data? For example, someone from US wants to visit this, this data in, in Singapore, there's a black box here. So Singapore guys can build this black box. People can, uh, US guys can go in there, can even send the data over there, but they still don't know what the Singapore guys uh, data is like, but they can still have the application done. At the same time, Singapore guys can rest assured the data is not being shared, uh, being leaked. Uh, it's not leaving their um, uh, uh, premise, right? So um, this right now has been applied onto a cohort of tens of thousands of patients, you know, very sensitive data, clinical and generic data, and the platforms, one platform in the US, one in Singapore, one in China, um, it could be the hospitals, research institutions, all these uh, different um, uh, uh, application scenarios can be handled by using a, a privacy computing a, a platform federation like this. Okay, so uh, re uh, com uh, re uh, a compliance to regulations is also something that's uh, very critical here. And uh, these pri privacy computing uh, um, solutions are, are very keen on that as well. Okay, you can also do um, more, but I, I, I don't think I, I want to talk too much. I, I want to leave a few minutes to the final, um, maybe uh, Q&A sessions. So um, let me uh, stop here. I thank you so much, Dr. Cao. Thank you for such a perfect instruction on the PET technologies. I believe You're it welcome. is um, very, um, you, you just said your vision is to build a big data system that using this, using this technology. So I believe we all learned a lot from what you yeah. talked. Yeah, so uh, do you, anyone have questions that you wanna ask Dr. Cao? Just type in the chat box or use the Q and A bar below. Uh, hi, can I just ask a question directly through the? Yeah, yeah, sure, Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to um, ask a question about the data um, cleaning process. Um, as yeah. you mentioned, the standardization is kind of complicated right now. The, the in the industry, people are probably using ICD nine and ICD ten mm -hmm. to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but how, how uh, for example, um, we have the claims data from the insurance company, we have the EMR from the hospitals, but how, um, is there any way that you can use the black box to standardize all of this di different data set from even the self-report data from the patient? Is there any way that is um, um, like unify all of this different source of data to one platform um, in, your, in your system? Thanks. Yeah, so, so for data cleansing is a little hard, as you can imagine. Uh, Michael, right? Yeah, Michael here. Yeah, yeah, data cleansing is a little hard because uh, nowadays uh, the data cleansing uh, uh, process, we, we actually have a data, data cleansing model, uh, a, a tool that does just that. It handles a lot of data uh, very, very efficiently using AI models, et cetera. But the, the tough thing here is for data cleansing, you need to have human interactions nowadays, right? Just imagine someone will do some data cleansing and some error will pop out. And uh, you, you, people need to look at those errors and say, okay, this is, um, I, 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 this is a, a error in, in, in input. Uh, this is actually maybe just a new entry and I need to create a new uh, master data, data standard for, the, for this piece of data. So that human interaction nowadays still cannot be uh, elim eliminated. Right, so, um, so still the, the data cleansing part of the work still uh, is, is largely uh, visible. It, it cannot be entirely uh, invisible uh, just yet. Yeah. Okay, gotcha, thanks. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. You have a, you, uh, I have a second question, if mm -hmm. you don't mind, yep. for um, the data privacy part. Um, as you mentioned, like in Singapore and in China, Mm -hmm. uh, data is not allowed to get overseas, probably. Yeah. But mm -hmm. actually, this part is um, kind of like a gray area. Basically, the data ownership is kind of like ambiguous right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, eventually, I think the data belongs to the patient, right? Eventually. But right now, yes. 
it seems like the majority of the data belongs to the hospitals. I mean, ninety percent of the data belongs to the hospitals. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, a lot of company they try to upload their data in the cloud. For example, mm -hmm. like Edu Cloud, what they do. I, I'm sure you have heard of this company, Edu Cloud, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, basically they try to uh, centralize all of the, all of this data in the cloud, but basically the cloud is owned by the hospital and they mm -hmm. try to get a report, but the report depends on the pharmaceutical companies and this mm -hmm. report can go overseas. So yeah. I just wanted to compare that platform, compare, uh, compare with your uh, privacy computing um, system. So any mm -hmm. difference with that, any uh, pros and cons, thanks. Yeah, so so I, I did hear uh, about you, Cloud, uh, that the company in China, uh, we, we are kind of, uh, we, we had crossed paths before, so uh, I, I know about them. But uh, I do not know uh, in much detail about the solution you just mentioned, but it, it does sound uh, pretty, um, it, it's, it's largely um, a, a common, um, common, common uh, situation in, in countries like, like China. Where, like you said, um, the data is not owned; it's supposed to be owned by by the patient, but really, it's the hospital that's controlling this data, right? So, so in in that in that scenario, the the hospital will be controlling the data, and uh, they will be uh, they they may allow someone to use their um, data to do certain ana analysis, etc., and uh, generate uh, a owning a report. I, I think what we can do here differently. Is but we, we we cannot change the ownership of the of, of this because that's up to the government, right? Uh, but what we could do is we can allow a more flexible and a powerful computational environment, in which the data owner or data owner or user, sorry, or data analyst can be in that environment and do more things than a traditional ways will allow. So I get the, the example here is in, in this black box kind of situation where the user can deposit all kinds of applications into that black box. So the black box is where uh, the data becomes invisible, right? So in, in, that, in that case, as long as the data cannot be seen by someone from a, a outsider, uh, more applications can happen. So you, you're gonna have more uh, flexibility using uh, these kind of uh, privacy computing based, uh, um, based solutions. And that's actually what we're doing nowadays in in in, in markets like uh, like uh, uh, China and uh, Singapore. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. You're welcome, Michael. Right, thank you, Justin and Michael. And also, we have a comment from Dan saying that nice presentation. Thanks, Dr. Tao, for sharing your insights. How to connect yes. with you for future cooperations? Oh, uh, sure. Um, so my, my company is a uh, uh, parity bit by AI. So it's, it's right, right down here. And uh, uh, anyone who can uh, wants to, um, wants to um, let, me, let me just type in the, uh, my email in here. So my, my email is justin.tao at parity Okay. And, right, uh, some... Yeah, just feel free to, yeah. to email me anytime. Um, yeah, yeah, I believe it's to, to the host and panelist. Maybe you can change oh, okay. to everyone. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I can see it now. Yeah. Yeah, so so if you if you guys go on to my website, uh, our website www.peritybit.ai, um, we were just going through a, a reconstruction of the of the website, so it does not have too much information on it yet. So um, it should be improved in the in the next uh, a few weeks. So just a last word, um, our company is uh, uh, six years old, so the website does not look like it's a six year old company's website. So <laughs> my my uh, apologies here. Sure. Okay. So, uh, if you, if anyone wants to cooperate with Doctor or connect with Doctor Tao, you can just send him an email or visit their um, website, yeah. as just showed on the slides shows. Also, uh, thank you again, Doctor Tao. Yeah. There is no more questions. Then I think we are we'll finish tonight's training. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if yeah. anyone has further questions, just um, email Doctor Tao or email Cube for mm -hmm. for more information. All right. Yeah.
Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, uh, the yeah. uh, guys from Cuba. My office is also at Cuba. So uh, if oh, yeah. Anyone, yeah. <laughs> the neighbors. Tenant at, at Cuba, feel free to come by. I'm on the first floor. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a great night. Bye. You too. Thank you. See you. Bye.